think of a muscle car. Are you sure? Mustang? Charger? Chevelle? Maybe. Many people seem to think everything from the 1960s or early 70s as a muscle car, forgetting that most of these cars came standard with an underpowered six-cylinder lacking anything resembling muscle. Many of the model names associated with muscle cars were marketed simply as mid-sized sedans, Cutlass, Coronet, Fairlane, and so on. Even the majority of the V8s offered in these cars were far from providing any real performance and stock trim. Even the sporty coupes of the period, known as pony cars, came in very vanilla-flavored versions. So what is a muscle car? To look at what a real muscle car is, we must look at the Judge, the Pontiac GTO, a car often considered to be the original muscle car, introduced in 1964. The concept was quite simple. Take a plain mid-sized model and drop in a bigger engine than necessary. In this case, a tricarb 389 cubic inch V8 into the mid-sized Pontiac Tempest. The Tempest and its better equipped Le Mans twin were available in coupe, convertible, sedan, and wagon, with a base 3.5 liter, 215 cubic inch, straight six, with 140 gross horsepower, or an optional 5.3 liter, 326 cubic inch, 280 gross horsepower V8, more than adequate for the 3,400 pound car. The GTO took the two-door versions of the same car, raised displacement to 6.4 liters, or 389 cubic inches, and horsepower to 325 to 348, and included the availability of other performance options, both functional and cosmetic, meaning the slowest version could do 60 in under 7 seconds, and the quarter mile in the mid-15s, or about a second quicker than the top Le Mans. In other words, into the realm of high-end sports cars of the period, from what was otherwise a family car. Soon the GTO would be joined by similar performance models from other GM divisions, such as Chevrolet's Super Sport 396 Chevelle. The 6.5 liter V8 produced 375 horsepower and 420 pound-feet of torque, pushing the 3,500 pound cars through the quarter mile in just over 15 seconds. But they wouldn't all go about it the same way. For example, Oldsmobile's 442 shared the 5.4 liter, 330 cubic inch V8, and 4-speed with the F85 Cutlass. With minor upgrades from the police package, including dual exhaust, bumping horsepower by a mere 15, although it was a second quicker, still managing a 15-second quarter mile. While Buick's GS400, fudged on GM's 400 cubic inch engine cap for mid-sized cars by using a 401, offering 75 more horsepower than the 300 cubic inch V8 and lesser Skylarks, reducing the quarter mile time by a second to under 15. And other American manufacturers would soon follow, but they didn't have the same restrictions on engine sizes, such as Ford's Fairlane GT or XL, or the Mercury Comet Cyclone. A 66 Fairlane GT390 was rated at 335 horsepower and 427 pound-feet of torque, and was good for a quarter mile in the high 14s. And although Ford started with the 390 V8, they quickly moved up through the 427, 428, and eventually 429. But the Fairlane Extra Lively, or Comet Cyclone, could also be had with a lowly 289. In fact, the XL package could be had with a six-cylinder, as could the Comet Caliente, with as little as 100 horsepower, gross. Dodge had the Coronet RT, and Plymouth the Belvedere GTX, which would soon be joined by the higher-end Dodge Charger and the budget Plymouth Roadrunner, offering engines ranging in size from 383 cubic inches to 440, and even a 426 Hemi. Soon, GM would also be offering lesser versions of their muscle cars, such as the Chevy Chevelle Super Sport 350, Oldsmobile Cutlass Rally 350, or Buick Skylark GS350, and Ford would start to offer small block V8s in the Fairlane GT. AMC had the Rebel SST, starting in 1967, that could be had with a 343 V8 with 280 horsepower, which could do the quarter mile in the high 15s, although the base engine was a 232 straight six with 145 horsepower. 
But for 1970, you could get the machine with a 390 cubic inch V8 with 340 horsepower and 430 pound-feet of torque, a high 14-second car. And by 1970, GM had given up on the engine size cap with all divisions offering 7.5 liters. Torque monsters that would be both expensive and rare. Oldsmobile was actually first with the 455-powered Hurst Olds getting around the engine cap in 1968 as a Hurst product when the 442 was at precisely 400 cubic inches. But it too would get a 455 in 1970 with 365 horsepower or with the 370 horsepower W30. The top 68 400 cubic inch 442 only had 360 horsepower and 440 pound-feet of torque, while the better equipped 455 Hurst Olds had 390 horsepower and 500 pound-feet of torque. All were capable of sub-14 second quarter miles when properly equipped. The GTO was officially proclaimed the judge in 1969, with a Ram Air 4 400 producing 370 horsepower and 445 pound-feet of torque and doing the quarter mile in 14 seconds with the high dramatic, but it too would move to a 455 cubic inch engine for 1970, although it was neither faster nor more powerful. As did the Buick GS, no longer called a Skylark, offering Stage 1, Stage 2, and GSX packages. A 455 Stage 1 GSX had 360 horsepower, 510 pound-feet of torque, and did a mid-14-second quarter mile. And, of course, there was the Chevelle Supersport 454, with up to a 450 horsepower LS6 version, costing more than $3,500. So what makes them muscle cars? Any mid-sized V8 rear-wheel drive car? Or is there a power requirement? Or an engine of a specific size? If so, what are those requirements? Is a Hemi Coronet still a muscle car, even if it has four doors? If a Super Sport 350 is a muscle car, what about a 350 Chevelle that isn't a Super Sport? And what about pony cars? Sporty compact-based coupes named for the Mustang a car that was originally introduced with a 2.8 liter 6 or a 4.3 liter or 4.7 liter V8. It was certainly more of an entry-level GT car than a muscle car, even with a quarter mile time as low as 16 seconds, at least to start. And the Barracuda that was introduced a few months earlier differed from the compact Valiant only cosmetically at first. But offering bigger engines in these smaller cars became the next muscle car trend. The Mustang would quickly upgrade to a 289 Hypo, then a 390, and eventually a 429 Boss. The Barracuda would similarly increase from a 273 to a 318 to a 340 to a 383 to the 426 Hemi and 446 pack. Others in the segment would include the Super Sport 396 Camaro, the Mercury Cougar 7 liter, the AMC Javelin AMX, the Dodge Challenger RT, and the Firebird Super Duty Trans Am. And naturally, not all performance packages meant giant engines. The TA Challenger and AA Arcuda were 5.6 liters, or 340 cubic inches. But the base engine in the Challenger and Barracuda remained the slow and reliable Slant 6. And the Z28 Camaro and Boss 302 Mustang had high output 5 liter V8s, while the big engine versions would quickly be killed off by high prices, ridiculous insurance premiums, and poor sales. And many packages suggested muscle car performance without actually including the powerful engines. Packages such as Super Sport, GT, or Mach 1 included things like bucket seats, hood scoops, and stripes but not necessarily any performance upgrade. What some people began to refer to as paint-on performance, the image without the actual power, something that would gain popularity in the late 70s. Which brings us to the other performance compacts. If a 289 Mustang is a muscle car, what about a 289 Falcon? Or a Super Sport 327 Chevy 2? It certainly seemed to fit all the boxes, except having a big block. Or a Dart GTS, which could have a big block, but did it need one? If it did, the Dodge Dart, 
as well as the Plymouth Barracuda A-bombs, could be had with either a 440 wedge or a 426 Hemi. But for a streetcar, the 340 certainly seemed to be enough for the duster, although it would upgrade to a 360. Then there was AMC's SC Rambler, or Scrambler, with its 315 horsepower 390, and its replacement, the Hornet SC 360. Ford's Grabber Maverick only had a 5 liter V8, but it weighed 250 pounds less than the Mustang with the same engine, making it half a second quicker in the quarter mile when similarly equipped. And if engine size to car size is a factor, where does the 5 liter V8 Gremlin fit in? And for that matter, what about the much larger and heavier 75 Nova Supersport? And what about the big block Corvettes? Can a sports car be a muscle car? Or were only the small block versions the real sports cars? Or the Shelby Cobra? The 289 Cobra was a sports car? And the 427 Cobra a muscle car? And prior to the muscle car movement, companies were offering super stocks. Homologation specials that were big cars with giant engines. Truly muscle cars before there were muscle cars. But these were sold as factory race cars that in some cases were street legal or could be made that way. Chevrolet's 360 horsepower 409 Supersport Impala introduced in 1961 or Pontiac's 421 Super Duty Grand Prix that arrived late in 1962 to be conservatively rated at 405 horsepower. And the Plymouth Superstock and Dodge Ram Charger with their 413 and 426 cross ram wedges with 415 to 425 horsepower. And the Ford Galaxy XL with the 401 horsepower 390 or the 405 horsepower 406 or the FE 427 with up to 425 horsepower an engine that would later find its way into the mid-sized Ford Fairlane Thunderbolt. Were these actually the first muscle cars? Many would say no. Some would suggest the Chrysler 300 was. Either the original 300 horsepower 331 Hemi car of 1955, or at least the 390 horsepower 392 Hemi 300C of 1957, or even the first firepower Hemi Chrysler of 1951 with its 180 horsepower. Or it could have been the 160 horsepower twin H power of the 1952 fabulous Hudson Hornet. Can a straight six be a muscle car, even if it's five liters or 308 cubic inches? And there was Oldsmobile's Rocket 88, a reasonable performer at its 1949 introduction. And within a few years, one of the fastest four passenger cars on the road. But there were more powerful pre-war cars with bigger engines. V12s and 16s, and supercharged 8s, although these were hardly mid-ranged family haulers. Or were they? But affordability hasn't ever been a key component of muscle. And what about the last muscle car? A title also applied to many vehicles. The 1974 Ventura GTO? Was it a real GTO? Or was the 1973 model the last real one? Some would say it was the 1972 model. What about the Roadrunner? Were the Volare Roadrunners of 76 to 80 muscle cars? Or was the 75 model the last real one? Or how about the 1974 model? Was the 442 still a muscle car in 1977? Was it still one in 1980? How about 1991? Or the mid-80s Hearst Olds? Certainly, some people consider Buick's Turbo V6 Grand National of the same period to be one. But were the less impressive Aero siblings the Chevy Monte Carlo Supersport, and Pontiac Grand Prix 2 Plus 2. And what about the Ford Thunderbird Turbo Coupe and the Mercury Cougar XR7 with the turbocharged four-cylinder or the later supercharged V6 version? What about the Ford Taurus SHO with its Yamaha V6 or the Dodge Spirit RT Turbo? They certainly were high-output mid-size sedans, but were those just sports sedans? Which begs the question of the difference between performance and muscle. The general consensus is that muscle is simply power, while performance includes things such as handling and braking, which is why a sports sedan is not the same thing as a muscle car. But can a sports sedan be a muscle car? Certainly the BMW M5 has been more muscle car than sports car. A 500 cubic inch Cadillac Eldorado may not be a muscle car, but what about a CTSV or a Blackwing? 
And I don't think AMG used the term hammer to suggest the car was graceful. Which brings us back to the same issue with the cars of the 1930s. Are premium cars not muscle cars? Perhaps they have to be more mainstream cars, like the Pontiac G8, Chevrolet Supersport, Dodge Charger, and Magnum, and the Chrysler 300. But it is hard to argue that modern pony cars aren't the most muscular cars to date, as far as horsepower per pound for a four-passenger vehicle. Cars like the Ford Mustang GT500, the Chevrolet Camaro ZL1, and the Dodge Challenger Demon. Overpowered they may be, with even the base models now being over 300 horsepower. But they are not exactly based on plain family sedans. At least not anymore. And then there's E-Muscle, coming soon to a Dodge dealership near you. Although when it comes to a plain sedan that's best asset is straight line performance, the Tesla Model S has long fit that bill as long as a certain type of sound isn't on your list of requirements. In the end, there's no clear definition of a muscle car, and in some cases can be more related to what you've done with it than what you started with. Where do you draw the line? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>